Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. I'm Paul Vogelsang, and this is episode number 450. At the start of summer, we all know that music. And as part of our Art of Living author interview series, our guest today is baseball writer, historian, Alan Gaff. Alan Gaff is author of the great new baseball book, The Lost Memoir of Lou Gehrig. I loved this book. And for those of us eager to have baseball back in our lives, but watching Korean baseball organizations brand of high energy baseball and hoping baseball will return soon, you're going to love this book too. Lou Gehrig, one of the greatest baseball players that ever lived, is so much more than the horrible disease that killed him. The first half of this book is told by Lou Gehrig in his own words through articles he wrote during his championship season in New York City. To be able to read Gehrig's words describing his entrance into professional baseball was priceless. This is a wonderful, wonderful story. I'll offer my thanks right now to our guest today, Alan Gaff, for collecting these forgotten newspaper articles and for writing this wonderful biography of Lou Gehrig. Throughout the 1920s, Lou Gehrig was one of the most famous men in the country. He was cementing his reputation as a baseball player of true greatness. Lou, the iron horse, showed up every day and played his heart out. His gentle charm and home run hitting made him a star at a time when the country was hungry for them. The Roaring Twenties positioned baseball at the heart of the nation's collective consciousness, and the Yankees were at the top of the American League. In the seven years since Babe Ruth had joined the team in 1920, they had finished first four times and had won the 1923 World Series. His tragically brief life has been immortalized in the classic 1942 film, The Pride of the Yankees, with Gary Cooper starring as the Hall of Fame slugger and reenacting Gary's famous speech in which he confessed, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Now it is our turn to be the lucky ones, reliving the exploits of a young, vibrant ball player as he again steps to the plate and begins following the babe. For many years, you covered first base for the Yankees. You were in there every day. No matter how many runs they were ahead or behind, giving all you had. You will live long in baseball. And for generations to come, while boys in America play baseball, they will point to your record with pride and satisfaction. I congratulate you. For the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad brag. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. When you look around, wouldn't you consider it privilege to associate yourself with such a fine-looking man as is standing standing in uniform in this ballpark ballpark today. today. That I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you. That, of course, is our guest today, Alan Gaff, reading from his new book, Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir. And we heard the famous farewell speech by Lou Gehrig at Yankee Stadium, a baseball legend. You know, when you speak about baseball, you speak about Lou Gehrig. We also think of all the other players. Scott Boris, an attorney for baseball players, has written a wonderful editorial in the New York Times in which he said so eloquently... In some of America's darkest moments, the country has turned to Major League Baseball to bring hope and normalcy back to everyday life. It is time again for baseball to serve. The millions of baseball fans in America continue to do so in a small way by playing a small part for the nation by staying at home, while enjoying a sense of hope and normalcy and watching the game we love. In the meantime, we can enjoy Alan Gaff's new book, the Lost Memoir of Lou Gehrig. Please join me in welcoming to the Not Old Better Show via internet phone, author Alan Gaff. Alan Gaff, welcome to the program. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you today. 
It's a pleasure to be with you, too. We're going to talk about your book, of course. It's just fascinating. I think the timing of our conversation and the book is perfect. We're, we're all kind of thinking about baseball right now. I, I've been thinking about baseball. Lou Gehrig is baseball to me in, in many ways. So tell us about Gehrig and the articles uh, that, that the book is, is – that the memoir is really written uh, upon because these, these articles, they're not so much – you know, a retired baseball player looking back. But these are actual in the moment uh, during this record-breaking season of Gehrig's. And they're, they're, they're beautiful. These essays are beautiful. And I, I kind of liken them to, or, or certainly they offer kind of an interesting juxtaposition to what we see today in, in Twitter <laughs> from famous athletes. This is just so much more. These are just beautiful uh, words. And so tell, tell us about this. Well, just just to sum up, Lou Gehrig's life. His story is is a combination of determination and sadness. His exploits on the baseball field made him an American hero, but his heartbreaking death made him into an American legend. And it was a real honor to be able to publish his straight from the heart uh, memoir written during the season of probably one of the best baseball teams in history. I was working on uh, some research for another topic. Uh, back in 2005, I had published a book on the Lost Battalion of World War I and thought that I could take a couple survivors and write an article about how they were involved in the Prohibition era as war heroes who were treated differently by the law. So I was doing research on a, a captain from California named Leo Stromi, and I came across the first of one of the uh, articles called Following the Babe that Lou Gehrig had written during 1927. And I thought, well, I basically stopped my research and read it. And I thought, well, oh, that's kind of nice. So the first thing I did, I found all of the, uh, the columns that were published under Following the Babe title and sort of got the whole story as, as Lou presented it to the public uh, during the, that record-breaking season. The, the, the story itself seemed to be too good to be true, but I started looking around and discovered that they had been basically overlooked and had been lost ever since they'd been published in 1927. They had been alluded to one or, by one or two authors but no one had ever used them as they stood. And I think they stand alone quite well. So I, I basically did a check through the copyright office and found out that uh, they had never been copyrighted and were available to be reprinted. The, uh, the way they came about was there was a gentleman named Christy Walsh, who was Babe Ruth's original agent. And as he became capable of, of representing Ruth and other uh, ball players with prominence in the, at the time, uh, he, re he realized that this young kid, Lou Gehrig, had potential uh, to bring him some more income. So what he did, um, he, he went to the Oakland Tribune and a, a newspaper in Pittsburgh and another one in, in Canada and basically syndicated Lou's columns but he did so outside the New York City area because obviously that, that, uh, that city was already saturated with Yankee coverage. So I got in touch with my agent, Roger Williams, who put us in touch with uh, Stuart Roberts at Simon & Schuster. And th they both had the same impression I had when I started. It's like, this has got to be too good to be true. But uh, eventually everybody came on board and Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir, was, uh, well, had its release date on May 12th of this year. And congratulations, too, for all of that and for all of your hard work in assembling this. So glad that you found this because, as I say, the story is fascinating. You've written an insightful biographical essay, which we'll talk about. But I, I do want to talk a little bit more about the articles. Maybe you could tell us which one was your favorite. There, there are so many great ones, and he just really... He really had a way with words, even then. Oh, he did. And it, everything in, in these articles are straight from the heart. 
Um, he has what uh, our family has determined would be a uh, a trademark humility, mm-hmm. which comes through in his articles the same way it comes through with his um, retirement speech on July 4th, 1939 at Yankee Stadium. It's just as if you were sitting in a, in a living room with him and he was just started to talk and reminisce about his life. As you mentioned, or er, well, alluded to earlier, it's, it's a different type of memoir because it's written at the height of his career. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not him looking back as a 70 or 80 year old man, um, recalling, you know, how he remembered things being a little unsure of dates and times and places and uh, as, as memories start to fade. So everything is just vibrant with, with youth and, and his uh, excitement about being a Yankee. As far as my favorite part of the book, I think my favorite part of the book isn't part of the following the babe columns. It's uh, an article that he wrote in uh, 1940 after he'd retired on his tips on how to watch a baseball game. <laughs> now, who else better to tell you how to watch a baseball game than a <laughs> Hall of Fame player? Right. And it, it's just tremendous to do that. And, and he he keeps it simple. It's like his, his greatest comment is, watch the ball. Don't be distracted <laughs> by what the coaches are doing on the coaching boxes, what somebody's doing in the stands, what the umpires are doing, what's going on in the dugout. Watch the ball because that's where all of the action is. I loved that too. That that was a treat, and and an, I sir, I didn't expect that. I loved the the tips, <laughs> and that's just a great one. It's just it's such an obvious one. You know, the other thing that I noticed, Alan Gaff, is that the photos in the book are excellent. And one that was most memorable to me, given the title of the articles following the Babe, was the picture of Babe Ruth standing next to the coffin of Gehrig as he's as he's passed. And I read in the the notes there about the photo that Ruth had to be escorted away because of just overwhelming grief. And Garrick and Ruth had this wonderful relationship, maybe a little on again, off again, perhaps at times. But you don't see that today either. And it certainly seemed to me that Garrick idolized Ruth. But as I looked at that photograph, Ruth sure seems to be looking he he almost looks as though he's idolizing Garrick there too. I, I don't know what you what you think about that photo if 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 that's one that stood out to you. But I, I love that picture. Well, I think one of the things that that did stick out to me was the relationship between the two men. Um, Garrick could could have been a, a a contender, a challenger to Ruth's title, but Ruth did not think of him that way. Uh, when Gehrig started with uh, the Yankees, Ruth kind of, yeah, okay, he's another new kid. We'll see how he does. But when Gehrig started to prove himself, Ruth took him on as an equal. And probably the best way to explain that is the, the press in 1927 had a column that they carried every day during the baseball season called the Big Four where they would keep track of the statistics for Babe Ruth, Trish Speaker, Ty Cobb, and Rogers Hornsby. By July of 1927, that had been expanded to the Big Five, including 24-year-old Lou Gehrig. Now, that's quite an advancement for a young kid who'd only played for the Yankees while he was in his third full season with the Yankees at the time. And like I say, Ruth could have seen him as a challenger to his uh, home run hitting, uh, his leadership of the team, but no, he gave Lou advice on how to hit better, how to concentrate on hitting balls to right field since he was a left-hander rather than long flies or maybe a double to uh, to left field or center field. He could use the same power and hit home runs and right. So he was he was very good at that. Um, showed the character that that Ruth had. He even went so far as to give uh, Lou Gehrig advice on how to manage his money, how to save his money for the future. Hmm. And there there was one instance when he was doing this and apparently in the dugout, being very sincere and telling Ruth, you need to save your money, plan for the future. And 
everybody else on the teammate was just falling over laughing because up to that point, Babe Ruth had squandered every cent he had ever made. <laughs> it was just rather ironic that he was passing on his hard-earned knowledge about <laughs> finance to Lou as a young kid just coming up. Do as I say, not necessarily how I do, perhaps. <laughs> I think the other thing that struck me was that yeah, Garrett could hit – but he wasn't such a great fielder, and Ruth gave him some tips there as well. What What do you think it was about Gehrig that made it so safe for Ruth to be this uh, mentor and to, you know, kind of have this more this this deeper connection relationship with him? I think part of it was the character of the two men. Ruth was everything that he has been rumored to be, and to, you know, all the stories about him have, have proven true. Um, he liked to drink, he liked to smoke, he liked to eat, he liked to womanize. So he led sort of the wild part of the crowd of the Yankees, <laughs> where Gehrig became sort of the leader of the guys who would take walks, go to movies. Uh, he liked to ride roller coasters. He liked to do things by himself. There were other members of the team that did that. I mean, um, there was like, uh, Oh, Combs, the center center fielder. He would read his Bible every night in the hotel, wherever they were. Uh, he, he wouldn't even drink a Coke hmm. when one other, but other parts of the team were out, uh, you know, drinking beer, hard liquor all during the middle of uh, prohibition, because if you were a Yankee and if you were a friend of Babe Ruth, you could get whatever you want, whenever you wanted it. <laughs> So in in, a, in essence, I think the best way maybe to describe the the relationship between Ruth and Gehrig was that uh, Babe was sort of his big brother on the Yankee team. We are with Alan Gaff. Alan Gaff has written a wonderful biographical essay to accompany Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir. The book is out now. The book is getting rave reviews. I loved it, Alan Gaff. I want to talk a, a little bit about the relationship that Gehrig had with Ty Cobb and the, the famous story about the fight between the two of them. Cobb, of course, was known as a scrappy, scrappy guy, scrappy player in, in many ways. So I wonder if you'd tell us about that story and what you learned then about Cobb and Gehrig. Well, would you like me to read a passage out of my book about it? Oh, that'd be great. I'd love it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You, Lou Gehrig's temper boiled over in a game against the Tigers on May 8th. In the bottom half of the ninth inning with the Yankees behind 7-5 to five and two outs, pitcher Earl Whitehill hit Lou's wrist with a curveball. Whitehill protested that the ball had actually nicked the knob of the bat. <clears throat> Umpire Bill Deenan was unsure and checked Lou's wrist before sending him on to first base. Earl walked all over, almost to Lou and began to call Gehrig yellow for squawking about being hit. An enraged Lou yelled back, if you think I'm yellow, come under the stands, but move to settle things then and there. Rookie umpire Bill McGowan grabbed Gehrig while Deneen pushed Whitehill back to the mound. After Babe Ruth grounded out to end the game, Gehrig and Whitehill made faces at each other as they left the field, but cooler heads kept them apart. Both teams entered the tunnel under the grandstand where Lou confronted center fielder and manager Ty Cobb. Screaming at him, you told Whitehill to hit me. He done it a purpose. You're always picking on me ever since I've been in baseball. In the dim light of the tunnel, there ensued what became a full-on fight. It was custard pie Gehrig against Peach's Cobb, no holds barred. While either shifting to take another swing or being pulled off Cobb by Babe Ruth, Lou hit his head on a concrete pillar and fell stunned. Cobb jumped up and kicked at Babe and Lou with his spikes in the semi-darkness, a flagrant violation of fighting rules. Only partially dressed, Babe chased Cobb into the Tigers' dressing room, but was promptly thrown out, the door slamming behind him. Three months later, custard pie and peaches were spotted on a ball field, kidding around about rumors of hostility between them. That's beautiful. Thank you. I, I think many of my audience are going to think about this in terms of today's players. It's interesting that you talk about the fight that goes under the grandstands and and even Cobb kicking with spikes. That's kind of, 
you know, off limits, and yet it, it happens. Some of that stuff really did happen. <laughs> Baseball has changed a lot over the years, that's for sure. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, one, one of the things that uh, doesn't relate directly to the book, but reporters traveled with the ball teams. And there was a reporter named Bozeman Bulger who uh, came to New York from Alabama to cover the New York Giants before World War I. And for the first few years, he actually roomed with Christy Mathewson. I don't think there are reporters who room with uh, ball players anymore. <laughs> and the, the way that players roomed back then, it was two to a room, which at that time meant two to a bed. Uh, there were actually two players that played for Connie Mack. One of them was a, a problem child. And so Mack assigned the other gentleman to room with uh, the problem. After a couple of years, the one gentleman came to Connie Mack and said, I need out of this arrangement. Rube eats animal crackers in bed and I end up with animal <laughs> crackers when I wake up in the morning stuck to my body. So <laughs> Connie Mack actually wrote a contract stipulation that there was no more eating animal crackers in bed between the two men. <laughs> I mean, you know, that does not happen anymore. Right. First of all, I'm pretty sure baseball players don't share beds. Right there. There's that. There's that. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, it's it's so good to talk to you, Alan Gaff. This book, again, um, the uh, title of the book is Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir. And, of course, you've written this wonderful biographical essay. I know you're very busy with the book, and so we sure appreciate your generous time. I just really have one final question for you. What did you learn in your research that fascinated you and, and maybe even surprised you about Lou Gehrig? I think the thing that stuck out more than anything else was his love for his mother. Um, he had had three siblings who died in infancy or early childhood. So he was the surviving uh, child for Christina Gehrig. And she doted on him. She did everything for him. Um, when he became a ball player, she basically became a, uh, a, a trainer and she would, she would take care of his bruises and he broken bones, but her real secret weapon was food. Um, she, she would later tell a, a newspaper reporter that all the Gehrigs were hefty. As a matter of fact, mom, dad, and Lou weighed a total of 675 pounds. And one of the things that, that just astounded me was on one occasion, she, did, she made a meal for seven people. The meal consisted of two turkeys, a suckling pig, Mountains of mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, turnips, lima beans, red cabbage, peas, onions, and stuffing, along with apple, mince, and pumpkin pie. His teammates would always kid him about his enormous appetite. His first um, nickname was Biscuit Pants because he had a pretty huge butt. But as I mentioned later, after 1925, they referred to him as custard pie because it was his favorite dessert and he could down a piece in either two or four bites, depending on the size. As, as far as his mother's opinion, when asked by a one reporter, she responded, he didn't become an athlete on spinach, <laughs> which is definitely true because uh, one of the things that you, you notice in the, uh, the photograph section of the book is his physique mm -hmm. and the the massive muscles that made him the, the great hitter that he was. Mm -hmm. Even in those days, that one picture of his back is just, there's some definition and some very pronounced muscular musculature there. It, it was like he was a hundred years ahead of time as far as conditioning mm -hmm. and training. Mm -hmm. it looked, yeah, it looked like it too. Well, Alan Gaff, author and uh, I suppose perhaps a historian, baseball writer, and uh, written this wonderful essay uh, to accompany the, the book, Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir. So great to, to talk to you. Again, the timing is perfect for this. I think we're all going to be, um, you know, hopeful about baseball's return. 
Uh, we're so hopeful for you and your family and your health. But I'm gonna I'm gonna remember Lou Gehrig's tips on how to watch a ball game as as the ball games come. <laughs> <laughs> well, one one last Please. comment to keep in mind yeah. is during the influenza pandemic of 1918 1919, Lou Gehrig was in high school. Eight year eight years later, the country was in the roaring twenties. And Lou Gehrig was playing for the Yankees at the peak of his career. So there is hope for the country going forward from Mm -hmm. where we are now. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for these wonderful sentiments and the stories you've shared with us. We're going to look forward to uh, following up with you, too, Alan Gaff. And uh, what what a great book. Again, Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir. And Alan Gaff has been our guest. He's written this biographical essay of Gehrig. It's in the book. We're going to put links to where you can find out more information about Alan Gaff as well as the book. But thank you, sir. Be well, be safe, and you know, practice that smart social distancing. But we sure, we sure appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Paul. I really enjoyed the conversation. My thanks to Alan Gaff for joining us today in his wonderful new book, The Lost Memoir of Lou Gehrig. My thanks to you, my wonderful audience of the Not Old Better show. Please keep your emails coming with show ideas and comments. I love getting your information. You can send that directly to me at info at notoldbetter.com. Please practice safe social distancing. Be healthy. Be well. Keep your family safe. Let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.